Hi there, my name's Simon Lester. I've been a gamekeeper for 40 years, passionate about nature and making the countryside a better place. So here we are in a beautiful wildflower meadow. Um, it's quite windy today, so we're not going to see the amount of butterflies, but if we wander around, we, we see some, there's lots of insects feeding on the nectar, the pollen and nectar in these uh, established meadows. But you can see, the fantastic array of flowers and grasses. Uh, people think grasses aren't important, but they are. So you've got oxide daisies, knapweed, ladies' bed straw, amongst a host of other things. Wild carrot just coming into flower now. And each insect needs a different flower to thrive. So this is why these habitats are fantastic for a whole host of things. And so you're go, going right from spring into the autumn and then the seeds of some of these plants also feed small birds. Obviously the whole breeding cycle happens here, so from laying eggs right through the larval stage and then pupate. But wildflower meadows need quite a lot of management and, and a long time to establish and we've lost so many wildflower meadows uh, since, since the war basically because of intensification of agriculture. So it's really important to create areas like this wherever you can. And this, this is, uh, wasn't a, a, a wildflower meadow three years ago. So it just shows you in three years what you can establish. So this is a bit of kit that every farmer and gamekeeper should, should have because this is the simplest way of actually showing if some of the conservation work that you're doing is actually yielding what you want to do. And you'd simply do 10 sweeps and look what's in there. And if it's bouncing, you're doing a good job. If there's nothing in there, you're doing a bad job, period. So, 10 sweeps. So you've got crickets and grasshoppers, leaf hoppers, all sorts of insects in here and it's absolutely bouncing and that's on a windy day which is not actually that good for the job. So it's working, ladybirds too. Here we are then in, a, in another type of crop. So we've left the wildflower meadow and come into this uh, mix of lots of different things um, which deliver straight away. So we planted this this spring and as you can see it's already delivering to a whole host of insects. Um, different plants uh, give different insects the ability to feed and then most of these will turn into seed crop and this crop will last for two years which is a uh, guarantees that continuity of overwintering insects as well as just feeding at, at, at this time of year. So this is a mix that's put together by Brights and here's Arthur from Brights to tell you a little bit more about it. As Simon says, I'm from uh, Bright Seeds. Um, both myself personally and the company are very passionate about wildlife conservation um, and with that in mind we put together this wild bird mixture. Uh, it's tailored very much towards pollinators so there's lots of early flowering brassicas like mustard in the mix uh, along with phacelia, some fodder radish and various other uh, goodies as well. Uh, the benefit, as Simon touched on, is the sort of quickness of how quickly it gets away. This was planted two or three months ago. Um, it's already up over knee height and offering lots of cover for wildlife, along with, as I mentioned, the, the nectar flower for bees and other pollinators, which are currently in, in decline, unfortunately. Um, this mixture, again, will last for two years. There's some kale in the bottom along with chicory and some other good cover, what we sort of call cover crops as opposed to feed rich ones. So they'll give very good cover through the winter. Um, and that sort of ties in with a hungry gap. So you get to sort of December through until early spring, March time. There's very little food around 
for wider farm and wildlife. All the sort of summer leaves have died back, berries are, are, are fairly few and far between, and this will be a really good uh, respite for them birds. How have you found it, Simon, wildlife-wise, in, in the short time this has been in? Yeah, well, I'd like, as I say, you get the continuity from the um, wildflower meadow, which is starting to die back now. So the uh, the amount of bees, because bees particularly like uh, uh, phacelia, it, it's it's amazing. I mean, I don't know how many types of bees there are, but there's all sorts here. And the fact that um, it does establish quickly, and it, as I say, it carries on for, for a couple of years. So you, you get that actual build-up, but also, in the mornings you see a whole host of small birds, blackbirds coming in and picking out the larvae. I mean there's green fly, there's all sorts of stuff in here and taking it back to the to their to their young, which is again fantastic. Yeah. And the other good thing which is worth touching on is how this quick fix as it were can actually connect habitats together very well. So it offers really good continuity across the landscape. So you can put in you know six meter strip of wild bird mix to connect two woods or two hedgerows. And it really, um, really helps in the sort of landscape scale conservation that we're sort of aiming for now, really. So it's a good way of connecting habitats together and offering a safe passage for, for wildlife, whether it be mammals, insects, uh, partridges and other birds. It can be a really good way of doing that quite quickly as well. Yeah, well, it's, it's ideal cover for protection as well, with, you know, with uh, growing predator numbers. But, you know, we need, we need to be able to hide birds and they can hide bird in here and, and it's a bit of a sanctuary. Yeah. And we can be very specific in terms of the content of the mix as well. Um, the general sort of criteria for a stewardship crop is that it needs to include six seed bearing species of which you've got things like mustard, triticale, millet, so on and so forth. So we can be quite selective in terms of what goes in there. So we can actually, you know, you can actually sort of lean towards certain species. So if a farmer or a gamekeeper is keen on encouraging uh, more corn bunting, we can put together a mix mm. uh, suited towards them. So that's a really useful, uh, useful part of the whole, the whole system, really. Yeah, I mean, it needs a flexible um, scheme to be able to uh, to, to tailor these uh, these mixes to to individual. And I think, I mean, they they do deliver, and there's no reason why. You know, you, you can't actually do it uh, at a reasonable cost as well. Absolutely. You know, cost-wise, a lot of shoots going back 10 years or more would have relied pretty much solely on, on big blocks of maize for game cover, or kale, which is a fairly monoculture habitat. Uh, in contrast, this obviously gives a lot more. It's alive with insects today, and it will be throughout the whole summer. Um, so the majority of shoots now um, and gamekeepers proactively will actually set out, they'll ring us early spring and we'll put together mixes as I've just discussed which will favour not only the game birds but also a whole host of other wildlife all the way through the year. So you've got the best of both worlds. It will hold pheasants and other game birds, partridges and so on but it will also do an awful lot for wildlife uh, in the long term as well. So we're joined here by my uh, colleague also from Bright Seeds, uh, Ben Dolbear. Uh, ben, what's the, what's the benefits of leaving a, a crop like this for, the, for a second year? This is a fine example of second year kale. The crop here is given a, a tremendous amount of nesting habitat in under here. It's an open canopy, uh, but the birds, the, the ground nesting birds can get in there and, and uh, make nests in the spring months. Um, we're also producing a lot of seed, so the kale's coming into, its, in, into seed for the second year. Uh, all these small pods will produce a tremendous amount of seed full of protein. Uh, for the for the birds to strive on, as Arthur mentioned earlier, through through the hungry gap later through the year. Is there a benefit of not having to touch the crop? So whereas earlier, obviously the crop next door was actually cultivated with tractors early in the spring. I presume this is just left untouched. Very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So through through those winter months, um, this will stay, won't be touched in the spring, so it won't disturb any of this habitat, uh, and, the, and given the uh, given the ground nesting birds a chance to uh, to nest in in the crop within the crop, um, it will give them cover all the way through, uh, and works really really well side by side against the other habitats. Uh, I think this illustrates the importance of a, a managed approach. Uh, so that we can continue to manage these areas so we don't end up with one thing or one crop on one area for the whole year. Uh, we can manage and manipulate the habitat we've got at certain stages. So uh, a managed approach is, is certainly the way forward. People that aren't lucky enough to have this size area at their disposal, can you create a decent habitat in a much smaller scale, say a back garden? 
yeah, in terms of you know, for pollinators and bees and so on? Certainly, yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, no conserva conservation area is too small. Uh, you can do something like this simply in a pot or, or even in a, uh, in a window uh, box, producing flowering species, producing pollen. It can be done on any, any scale, small or large. So to wrap up, I just wanted to emphasise the, the positive link between shooting and conservation. All our clients, whether it be gamekeepers, farmers, shoot managers, uh, they all get equal buzz from creating a, a nice wildlife habitat such as this one, which is alive with nectar-rich plants and winter food, uh, as they would do from a, from a shoot day. They really are keen on helping everything, not just game birds, but the whole farmland ecosystem. So all these habitats we've seen are, are really, really important and it's important to have that connectivity. So whether it's a vole in the ground or a barn owl that's coming in or, or the myriad of insects, it's very, very important to have these habitats. But what we've got to remember, we need to get children out to educate them about these habitats and how we run the countryside from a practical point of view. And this is where the NGO Educational Trust and uh, uh, you know lots of gamekeepers help us but I can't stress how important it is to get more children out in the countryside to actually show them what really happened.